Jelly effect. On the big fan of the show, Chuck O'Jelly, and he's been known for many years as a blind GFK researcher specializing in intelligence agency involvement in multiple assassinations, propaganda, and other global criminal operations in the 20th and 21st century. Your listeners are extremely fortunate to have you. And now, and now the, most, the most underrated voice in all, in all media. Chuck O'Jelly! <laughs> 26th day of November 2018, allegedly according to that thing we call a calendar. This indeed is the Ocelli Effect, broadcast live from the facilities of Ocelli.com, but also heard in a variety of other places. We do welcome you to this show on a moon day, which is going to start an interesting broadcast week, I promise. Uh, on Tuesday, tonight, by the way, well, let's, let's begin with tonight. How about that? Tonight, Jordan Maxwell's running just a touch late, but... Uh, he should be on with me very shortly, and we're going to continue the series and the discussion that we've been having for many weeks. On Tuesday, um, we will have J.P. Satilli with us, and also regular Joe has agreed to join us in the first hour well, where Mike Swanson would normally be because Mike will be away and unable to join us. On uh, Wednesday... Looks like we're going to have Joseph Flatley about his new book, and that one ought to be a most interesting <laughs> Um, kind of a, a mental uh, yoga test there. I don't know, contortion of the mind, I think, might go on just a little bit with that discussion with Joseph Flatley. On Thursday, I may have an unpleasant conversation with Jefferson Morley, and Friday is beginning to look a lot more interesting than I thought it would, but has not been solidified just yet. So uh, that's the way the week rolls out so far. And we have a couple of other irons in the fire, so to speak. So um, apparently I've got a little bit of a technical issue with grabbing Jordan, so I'm going to do my best to get a hold of him before we get into the subject matter tonight. I want you guys to, uh, while I'm doing this, I want you guys to uh, uh, remember that we are taking questions. Jordan appreciates them. So if you'd like, you can go to the live chat room at Ocelli.com. You can also email it to me, info at Ocelli.com. You could... Uh, Let's see, what else should I do? I'll keep the email open. I'll go to Twitter, I guess, if you want a private message, a question to Jordan there. Or if you're on my Skype list and you wish to send me a text message on there regarding the subject matter for tonight. Now, we are going to start off with religion. It does seem as though uh, Jordan might want to expand a little bit on that particular topic tonight uh, in some ways that uh, he normally doesn't. But you know, it seems like every week holds that sort of promise. So, again, continuing exactly the thing that we need to continue. Tell you what I'm going to do, though. I'm going to take a short break and see if I can't get Jordan on the phone elsewhere, which you guys won't be able to hear, um, and, and see what we can do about getting him right on and into the discussion. Because, um, hmm, a little, little strange at the moment. Uh, normally he's right there ready and waiting. So anyway, uh, what we'll do in the meantime is play a little song from Cirrus Minor. It's called Awaiting Dilation. Here at Ocelli.com, and I'll be right back with all hope in mind the Jordan Maxwell. So I just spoke to Jordan off air really quickly. He, he is running late, yes, but uh, will be joining us very shortly. Now I have a couple of questions from you guys already loaded up and ready to go. We shall uh, soon see what else we uh, wind up discussing. I never can tell exactly what direction Jordan is going to go in, but uh, he is just preparing, plugging in his mic and all that good stuff. So what we'll do, because I took a very long break there at the very onset of the show, is get straight into it with him in uh you know as soon as he calls in, and we'll skip the normal break that we take at the one hour mark, just just to be sure. Uh, we, we might take a, like maybe a two minute break instead of the normal five, six, seven that I do at that time, but it'll be very, very brief and, uh, we'll get straight on into everything, uh, as soon as Jordan arrives. Meanwhile, uh, if you want to enter some of those questions, you can, if you're on my Skype list, do that. I am also going to, uh, open up, I think I said I'll open up Twitter, so I'll do that right now. I'll open up Twitter if you guys have at Ocelli Effect at Twitter. You can uh, send me a question that way without an issue. Um, but, Jordan, I did get a hold of him, and he will be with us shortly. So uh, so there there we go. If uh, if you guys, 
you know, want to drop a question there at Twitter, no problem in the live chat room, no problem on the Skype, no problem. And, uh, hey, even the email, info at ocelli.com. Any question which is even remotely, um, reasonable, <laughs> let's put it that way, uh, reasonable, um, I will get straight on to it. Now, I'm also going to do a little presentation, uh, on my own regarding some of this material coming up in, uh, I don't know if I'm going to make that an extra thing. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll take a little bit of listener feedback and see where you guys want to go because um, some of the odder questions that have come up because of the series with Jordan about religion also involve um, also involve things like the uh, the history of Samaria and stuff like that. And um, this way. I can uh, do that presentation on my own at some point, and I'm not prepared to do it tonight. Otherwise, I might have just launched into it. But uh, I do actually have Jordan Maxwell with me now. And yep. if you go to jordanmaxwellshow.com, you can follow up on all these subjects, especially if you go ahead and join the Research Society, which there's a button for it at jordanmaxwellshow.com. Uh, there's also videos which one can download and have right away on demand for a small fee over there so that you don't have to buy a DVD or anything like that. You're getting them straight from the man himself. When you go into the Research Society, though, there's a lot more material in there. There's uh, literally, I think, a couple of ebooks. There's uh, definitely videos. There's links to things. There's information, images, stuff that is not necessarily everywhere, and it's all grouped together about things like government, banking, religion, so on and so forth, and a lot of in-depth ways to get into it. But it all begins at the only website, which is Jordan Maxwell's, actually. Actually, the man's website, jordanmaxwellshow.com. And that's the only website that's his, just so you know. Anything that's you know connected or recommended there, that's his business. That's what he chose. <laughs> you, you find his name in a lot of places, but not necessarily being presented to it you know, being presented to you by him, number one. Number two, you'll also find that uh, you can email Jordan there, and it actually gets to Jordan. And you can make donations and things like that. Uh, also at the website, all of those things are available there, plus a public section which has general information as well. But anyway, Jordan. <laughs> yes, sir. Great to have you along. Well, we, uh, thank you. Thank we do you have for a, inviting me. Absolutely, and, and we're continuing on with this series. Now, we've got a couple of questions already loaded up. Uh, okay. I have invited people, of course, to drop more if they want in the chat room or on Skype, or they can send it to me via email right now while we're on the air. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you don't get it to us by the time we're on the air, I will absolutely save it for next time, which I have a few of those saved up already. But first of all, I'd like to find out how you're doing today. Uh, well, comparatively well for uh, for a 78 year old, I'm doing okay. I think I, I I'm doing all right when it comes to my work and thinking, but not getting around too well. I'm getting to where I'm kind of uh, being stuck at home and stuck in one room because I don't get out too much. But you know, and I'm not able to do a whole lot anymore like I used to. I was always running. All my life I've been running and trying to get done with the things I feel I need to do. But today I just don't have the uh, the, the old stuff to, you know, the old stamina to do the things I want to do. And that's really disgusting to me because there's so many places I'd like to go and talk to people and and do seminars and so many things I want to say and need to say and people need to hear. <coughs> Excuse me. And and I, so I, I guess the best way to handle what I need to do is do it by radio because at least this way people can re, it can be recorded and heard later. Because I got so many things I want to tell people that they don't know. And it's fascinating subjects about how much the world is ill-informed on. Well, th this, uh, is all, this is all part of the... Oops, wait a second there. There we go. <laughs> this is yep. all uh, uh, part of the discussion uh, that, that needs to be had, sure. And I love listening to you on anything that you're uh, you're talking uh, on, you know, when it, whether it's a video or it's, a, you know, clips that people use from your videos or whatever. I love encountering your... 
a uh, very concise way of uh, giving presentations. Another thing, by the way, if somebody's listening to this right now and you feel as though you'd like to have Jordan come to you and talk to you or give a presentation at a conference or something like that, if you wanted to do that, um, actually, now, now the thing is... <laughs> Neither Jordan nor myself have the money necessarily to send Jordan somewhere, but on occasion you would be willing to work something out where if uh, if they're willing to pay your expenses to go to a conference and give a presentation about this topic or others, uh, all they would have to do really is email you over at jordanmaxwellshow.com and see if they could work it out with you directly, right? Yeah, well, that's true, uh, uh, but like I said, I don't get out very much anymore. I don't, I don't really travel very much anymore. I've traveled around the world. I've given lectures in Egypt and the Middle East and all over Europe. I've traveled extensively, yeah. but you know, at 78 years old, I just don't do well at traveling, and those 19-hour plane trips are 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 very destructive now to me but uh, and right. I don't really get out very much anymore but what I can do is I do uh, individual uh, counseling uh, r- telephone calls consulting and also with the new technology that the web has that I can uh, do seminars and it can be seen in different places in the world I've done that I've done seminars in France and Europe uh, from here, from my home, because I, you know, the, the technology is there now. So mm. uh, I, I, I don't go out very much anymore because I'm, I'm too old and tired and, and, and burned out, right, and it right. takes so much out of me to travel anymore. Well, I'm I'm thinking more like a short trip. I mean, if somebody wanted you to say go to Texas or California or yeah, you yeah, know, or somewhere yeah. like Seattle, or something I'll, like that. I would be interested to hear and see and talk with them. I would be interested to talk talk with them, and if it's something that we look like we could do, then I I wouldn't mind doing that because I really enjoy talking to audiences. I, it's something I really have enjoyed all my life is being able to talk to people and wake mm-hmm. them up. And have the and see the the light on their face when they when they finally hear something that's true, and it makes sense. And then finally they begin to see what I'm talking about. It's very rewarding to educate people. It's a very rewarding career to be able to speak to people, and wake them up and tell them things that they've known all their life. They knew something was wrong, but you tell them and explain it to them. So right. that they can finally understand it correctly, what is going on on the earth today. And that's what I've been doing for years, and I love doing it. So well, that's why radio is best for me, oh, radio sure. and uh, and my videos. No, a- absolutely. And I, and I know you appreciate it when people email you, too, uh, to yep. let you know. Even, even, you know, again, you could just email stuff to Jordan and tell him, you know, look, I, I was listening to the show, I learned this, or... You know, or I have a question, or uh, you know, that, that's another thing you like to see is that you you cause somebody to think, you cause them to become uh, educated more, more yep. than they were before, uh, and uh, even even an email is something you appreciate. If you can't see them face to face, you you can also get get a hold of them that way. So yes, it's very rewarding to me when I get people emailing me because I at my age I live by myself I have no family I live on by myself and do all that I do by myself and so it's very rewarding for for you know in my life now to have people contact me and and uh, you know just so that I know they're out there and that they care and that I'm actually being able to uh, affect other people and, and causing them to think and wake up and ask questions and all kinds of it's just very nice to, to, to get emails from people who care about you and who care about what you're doing and to know that you're making some kind of, uh, of an impact on people so if you have anything you want to talk with me about just email me email me mm-hmm. is the best way to contact me it's the only way really Right, because I, I I live on my computer twenty four seven. I live in and and continually monitor my emails because I get emails from all over the world, and a lot of them are very important. 
a lot of important people in the world will tell me things about the subjects that I deal with that I didn't know. And, uh, and, and I learn a lot from people. I learn a lot from listening to people who are experts in different subjects that I talk about, I know about, but I always say I'm not the world's foremost uh, expert. I'm not the foremost expert in the world on anything. I'm just an ordinary man pursuing extraordinary knowledge. Right. But I learn a lot from people. Lots of interesting people write me and tell me things that I had no, where, no way of knowing. I've had professors at universities in England uh, write me and say they heard me talking about this or that, and let me explain to you what this and that means. And uh, and then I've got something now. Now I've got something really good that I can share with people. Right. Uh, for instance, a classic example is I'm I've been talking for years about the difference between Jesus being God's son, S O N, or S U N. I say that Jesus is a symbol for the son, S U N. Not S O N. And then I say, and I've been saying it for many years, that S O N and S U N are interchangeable. It's the same word, it just is interchangeable. So therefore, when you are told that Jesus is God's Son, it's not his S O N, it says S U N. And Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Well, of course, the Son is the light of the world. And we are told that Jesus is our risen Savior. Well, of course, the S-U-N, Son of God, is the risen Savior. Uh, of course, it's our risen Savior. If it doesn't rise in the morning, we're dead. Nothing's going to grow. We're going to freeze to death. Right. So it is your risen Savior. And so, uh, and then I got an email from a professor in uni- at a university in England an English professor who said, incidentally, Jordan, you're talking about the difference between S-O-N and S-U-N. Yes, in English, there's a problem called the lazy O. Lazy O. Mm -hmm. And the idea in English of this uh, concept of the lazy O is that... uh, when the when the translators were translating all the other languages into English, and they were translating other documents, etc., from around the world into the King's English, many many years ago, uh, you know, during the Middle Ages, they came across a word S O N and S U N, and they call it the lazy O because the the translators and the King James translators said that the same it's the same word it can be spelled s u n or s o n and it and and it didn't mean two different things back then it was just the way it was spelled hmm. and so today of course we have now meanings that we have now put onto words so that s u n means that that bright morning star that comes up and lights the world, as opposed to S O M, which is your boy, your your offspring, your male offspring. Right. Why do we call him your son? Because he is the light of your life, and so the light that lights up your life is a, is your son. And so he said, but that in actual point of fact, in English there is the the proposition in English, the S U N and S O N is the same identical word in English. It's called the lazy O. Look it up in the English uh, language, and it explains why the translators use the same word and spell it two different ways. It could be spelled either way all the time. In any in any situation, you can spell it S O N or S U N, and so I've been told people uh, Christians have said, "Well, Jordan is just mixing up words." No, that's the way the English professors in England will tell you. That's the way it was done. You right. could spell "son" either way, and it meant the same thing, whatever. But we have put understandings on the on the language today. That doesn't mean what it meant you know, 500 years ago in the King's English. 
Well, that's a, that's well, the thing when you study etymology that you discover that a lot of things that uh, have contemporary meanings do not necessarily still mean the same thing that they meant 500, 600 uh, years ago. It, it, it's it's exactly apparently right. the same word, but I mean, even taking a, a look at a word completely unrelated to the subject like nice, mm -hmm. the word nice is not very nice. <laughs> you know, if you take a look <laughs> at the etymology, uh, it, it, you know, the, the old, the old phrase, right? Uh, common yep. phrase. He's a nice guy. Now, we, you and I know what we mean when we say that, Jordan, but if you take a look at the word nice, the way it w originated and uh, came from another language, as most things do in the quote English end quote language, uh, it's kind of funny because originally it really meant somebody who's uh, not very bright and uh, easily manipulated. <laughs> and I imagine nice guys might not always be bright. I mean, if, if, if you're not so intelligent, the world is a lot easier to swallow as a nice place. Maybe you're happier if you're not intelligent enough to know how bad well, the world yeah, around because... you is. But it's an interesting thing that a nice guy is not really a nice guy the way we mean it. Uh, That's right. The so, word does not mean the same as what it was originally meant. Right. So It doesn't mean that uh, yeah. what we call nice today is not what it meant when that word first arrived on the scene. When we first used that word, it didn't mean what we mean today. Right. And, and I've got so a couple of questions what... from some people that uh, uh, today we would say they're, they're probably nice people, but... I don't mean it in the etymology, you know, in the in the correct etymology, you know, the way it originated. Uh, I, I certainly don't mean it that way. But uh, some people have written in a couple of uh, odd questions, and mm -hmm. uh, I want to enter them into the discussion because they have been listening to the series. Uh, another talk show host uh, uh, that had me on as a guest even mentioned that uh, he really appreciated the series with you and thought it was uh, really, really solid the way that it's gone so far. Well, that's um, good. That's good. I appreciate it. And, uh, you know, so uh, I know that a lot of people are listening, and uh, a few people have commented, and some have sent questions. So I'm going to start with the easiest one here. Um, and let's see. This is uh, this is from Joan, and she asks, uh, what does uh, Jordan think of the work of, Z okay, I always screw this up, but Zachariah Sitchin, I think yep. is his name. And uh, you know, it's pronunciation that, that bothers me there, but I, I think I did it right. Zachariah Sitchin and uh, and the work online of the group that calls themselves Spirit Science. Uh, is Jordan familiar with both, and what does he think of them in general in relation to the topic of religion? Okay. Yeah. That's the way the question well, is. Well, I was in business with Zachariah Sitchin. I wasn't just one of his friends and and was a you know and read his work, but I was actually a business partner with with Zachariah Sitchin. So I knew a lot about him, and he and I had many many conversations because we were business partners, and I would get him uh, to speak at certain lectures and get him to speak at conferences and. I helped him get some of his books published, and I got him to speak in different uh, uh, you know, seminars and different public lectures. So I was in business with Zachariah Sitchin, and he told me a lot of things, interesting things that uh, I don't I don't feel qualified to talk about in public. I don't think it's the, the right place to talk about some of the private conversations that he and I had. All I will say is that there was more to Zachariah Sitchin and his work and his story than meets the eye. He knew a lot more than he was telling us. Mm -hmm. And he was very interestingly connected behind the scenes to some very powerful people. And some really interesting stuff was going on with Zachariah Sitchin that people do not know. And I don't feel qualified to talk about in public. But, uh, but I'm just saying he... He was very, very knowledgeable, and and I wish I could, I wish I could tell you some of the conversations we had in private mm. that I you know that would not be uh, it would not be right to do, but uh, it would really uh, it would really excite your imagination if I told you some things about Zechariah that I know. 
because he was very well connected behind the scenes throughout the world. There were a lot of very powerful people who knew Zachariah Sitchin. They, they knew about his work and what he was doing, and I, and, they, and I knew about them because I was in business with him. Uh, what was the other person's name, the other second? Uh, they ask uh, about Spirit Science, um, which I know is a YouTube channel, but I think also has a website, uh, and they've gone through... The uh, are, are you familiar with them? That, that that's the question. Really? No, uh, no, no. What was the name again? Spirit Science. Spirit Simon. Science. It's a group of people. They call themselves Spirit Science. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. Spirit Science. I've seen that. No, but I haven't really looked into their work. No, but I do remember seeing, coming across spirit science. I remember seeing that. Mm. But I have not looked into it myself, so I, I'm not really qualified to talk about it. No, fair but, enough. But I, do know. Know, but I do know about them. I'm a, I'll have to look at that. Now, I'm writing it down. I'm going to have to look at that when, when we're through with the show. Yeah, I it think sounds it's a, very interesting, spirit science. Yeah, I mean, it, look, if you start on YouTube, they have a very interesting uh, a set of presentations. Um, they definitely, uh, you know, if you're looking at stuff that, get, you know, is related to Gaia TV, you'll find them related to them as well. Uh, it's interesting. It's, yeah. it's very interesting. I, I don't know. I'm, if they didn't ask for my commentary, so uh, they asked you. But since, yeah, uh, you well, know, I, hey, maybe you'll you'll look at it and you'll, you'll discover uh, – that you need to look at it some more. I don't know, Jordan. It would be great to hear about it. But anyways. I'm, I'm always open because I'm always open to hear what people are into, people who are really dedicated their life to certain subjects. I want to know what they know. I want to hear what they have to say because I'm. that's the way I have come to educate myself as being in the company of really extraordinary people who have talked with me in private. And and I say to the public all the time, I'm not that clever. I'm not that smart. I, I What I bring to the table are the people that I have met in my life mm -hmm. and the subjects which they have opened me up to that I had no idea in the world that existed. And the Zachariah Sitchin is just one of many people that I got involved with. I wanted to promote him, and so I became a business partner. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's a whole lot more going on in the world and a lot of interesting people out there that I have had the privilege of meeting and talking with and becoming close friends with. And this is why I talk about the things I do because these are the kind of people I like being around. I love hearing the, the scientists and philosophers and teachers and researchers, astronauts and politicians, all kinds of interesting people telling me all kinds of phenomenally interesting things about the world we live in, and that's why I do what I do, because I love being able to share with the world of mankind. I want to share with everyone what I have been learning over the years. Mm. So that's what I do, and so much, so much of it is so controversial. Why? Because most people have never heard real truth about much of anything. Right. So that's, that's what I do, and that's who I am, and that's why I try and stay on the cutting edge of what's happening around the world by talking to all the best of the best. And I've got so many dear friends that have let me in on their work, and, and I've had so many interesting experiences learning about things I didn't even know existed. Hmm. Well, so, you know, a, another question comes in, and, and this one uh, is is from somebody who was definitely listening to an earlier show. Uh, they they stated that they had caught it on YouTube, actually, and um, I don't think I saved his name here. I know it was a guy. I remember that. So I'm sorry uh, to you if you're listening. I didn't save your name in my notes here, but um, the question is pretty straightforward. Uh, I heard Jordan say that uh, he did not believe that uh, the Old Testament existed uh, early on or before the Christian version of the story. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes. But, but here's the question. Then what does he make of the Dead Sea Scrolls and many of the artifacts that have been discovered that seem to suggest that... Uh, the Jewish story is much older 
than most people believe and was a story that previously existed. Okay, that that's that's the whole question, Jordan. I'm well, I'm just true. voicing it. So you know, yes, but. but those stories did pre-exist, and I'm just saying that uh, according to the best minds today in Israel, the best philosophers, teachers, uh, researchers, authors, uh, especially professors in university and books coming out of Israel, there's a lot of academic uh, foundation for the idea that ancient Israel never existed. I do not believe that ancient Israel is a fact of history. I do not believe that there was a Jewish religion before the uh, A.D., I don't believe there was any such a thing as a as a uh, of an ancient Israel ever existed. I think it is a mere story that is not backed up by history and it has no basis in history whatsoever. Because I know for a fact that there was no Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There was no King Solomon and King David. I re- I remember finding many years ago documents of research has been done on the ancient uh, Israeli religion, the ancient Israel, and it was saying there never was an ancient Israel. Israel today we know is not the ancient Israel of the ancient uh, in the in the Old Testament of the Bible, and yeah. uh, what we call today. The Old Testament in the Bible is actually the religion of the Phoenician Canaanites. There is no language. There there is no, in fact, Hebrew language. The Hebrew language is simply a particular dialect or a particular slant on the old Canaanite uh, religion, the old Canaanite Phoenician language. Because in uh, thousands of years ago, when the ancient Israel was supposed to have existed, there was no ancient Israel. There was Phoenicia Cana. And the Canaanites were in the area we call Israel today. They were called Canaanites, the land of Cana. And the Canaanite people spoke a particular language. It was called Phoenician, a Phoenician language. And the Phoenician language was spoken in Cana, and today the Phoenician language is referred to as Hebrew. And so when you hear Jews talking, uh, and they will tell you, well, in the Hebrew language it says this is that. I say there was no Hebrew. Mm. There is no Hebrew language. It's a Phoenician Canaanite. So talk to me about what the Phoenician Canaanite language says, because that's what you call uh, Hebrew. And so, if you understand that there was no Hebrew, uh, one professor in Israel said that connecting, uh, the Islamic, uh, the Islamic, what we call the ancient Hebrew language with the Canaanite is like connecting, uh, the English speaking America with, with London and with England. It's the same language, but just a little different. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, uh, the Americans speak the language a little different than it's, than it's spoken in England, but it's the same English language. And so the people are we call today Hebrews, they speak a language which is the same as the ancient language, but that same ancient language is not Hebrew as Phoenician Canaanite. Well, and another, so another original, way to look at that would be also with Spanish, because there's proper Castilian Spanish, and then there are forms of Spanish that are spoken in many countries that differ from Spain's precisely. Spanish. So That's I mean, exactly it's just, what I'm saying. Right. Another example. I'm just giving another example in case somebody says, yeah, "Well, yeah. you know, English is kind of the same anyway." A lot of Americans don't realize it. It is a bit different. Uh, yep. Even some words are spelled differently, but. Uh, but Spanish is another good example of this where you have, uh, uh, various countries in South America, a lot of them speak Portuguese, but, you know, or a form of Portuguese, I should say, which is again different from Spanish, but, uh, but two Spanish speakers, you know, one from Spain and say one from Mexico, easy example there, um, they speak differently. They might be able to understand one another, 
and there are a lot of common links to the languages, certainly, and a lot of people describe it as the same thing, but it really isn't. There are differences. It's sort of like that, right? That's exactly what I'm saying. That's the difference between the Hebrew language and the Phoenician, Canaanite, Phoenician language. Mm -hmm. The Phoenician language is the mother tongue, and Hebrew is just another way uh, uh, other other groups have used that language. So and in the so analogy, we, uh, England would be the Phoenician, you know, English itself, England, England's English would be the Phoenician tongue. Uh, exactly. And Spain, Spanish, uh, Spain, uh, excuse me, let me try this again. Spanish language from Spain would be the mother tongue, and the Mexican language would end up being like the Hebrew language. The American language exactly. would be like the Hebrew language versus the original. So it's like that. It's it's very, very similar, but slightly right. different. Okay. But slightly different Perfect. because of the people. And so, therefore, uh, we say today in America, we say that we speak the American language. We speak America. No, you don't speak American, you are American, you speak a mother tongue, which is English. Mm -hmm. And so when we say that, well, these, these people are speaking Hebrew. No, they are Hebrew, but they're speaking a Phoenician language. Right. They are Hebrew. And so we don't know the difference, so we just say, oh, well, they're Hebrews, so they're speaking Hebrew. No, they're Hebrews, but they're speaking Phoenician. It's a Phoenician ancient Canaanite language. So when you hear the idea of an ancient place called the land of Cana, that's the Hebrews today are from the land of Cana. They were actually Canaanites. Mm. And so when you read in the scriptures about the Canaanites, well, that's who today is in charge of Israel, the Canaanites. Right. They're not They're not a mystical people called the Hebrews. There was no King David. There was no King Solomon. I am telling you, there was no king. There was all of those words and all those infamous people in the Old Testament never existed. And we say, well, you know, if you go back to one of the earliest Bibles, I came across one in an old bookstore once, an old Bible. And it, and everywhere where the Bible talks about King David, it said King Druid, D-R-U-I-D, not D-A-V-I-D. And in, in India, they have a Druid religion. <laughs> Excuse me. No, no problem, in, Jordan. You know, and, India, and the, the and, thing about this is that, again, with the languages changing over time, th th this is a, 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 a function of time, honestly, and, and also of development because, for instance, there was no reason, say, for you know, the, the original English language to have a word for, I don't know, pick something, computer, uh, initially, right? And That's so right. the language might develop and they might have slightly different names in England for a computer than we do here, and therefore the split, you know, begins to happen, right? And there's also things that are only indigenous, say, to this part of the world that maybe they don't even have in the UK. Uh, right. So therefore... We have to develop words or adopt an existing word from some other language in order to take it in. Doesn't even necessarily mean that the uh, English English uses it. Uh, That's right. You know, and and the same thing happened with the Spanish, and I imagine with the uh, with the Hebrew and uh, uh, you know Phoenician. Because here's the interesting thing: um, some people talk about there's ancient Hebrew and then there's more modern Hebrew, right? Languages yeah. over time change. They must, as a matter of function, uh, that you you have to develop new words for new things. Uh, if somebody invents a wholly new object, you got to call it by something. If there That's is a right. new process that did not exist before, uh, you may have to describe it as something. And sometimes they reach into the past and adopt an old world word from the past to mean something new, or. They uh, uh, create a new word, <laughs> you know, very Precisely. simple, right? Yep, so it's very yeah. simple. And also, there is a hidden connection between the Hebrew people, the Jewish, what we call Jewish, and German. There is a very definite connection behind the scenes that has never been talked about in public. There is a definite connection between being Jewish and German. 
Germany or the German people are connected to the Jewish people. And the Jewish people are connected to the German philosophies. The German religion is Jewish. The Jewish religion is German. <clears throat> it's a very difficult subject, and I haven't got to the bottom of it yet, but I do know that much, that there is a definite connection between being Jewish and German. Oh, yeah, you, you've certainly <clears throat> talked about it on here uh, quite a bit. In the <clears throat> symbols, even uh, the most infamous symbol of the Third Reich, uh, you've discussed that and exactly how it is on the very floors. You can look to the earlier episodes. It's on the floors of synagogues, that thing uh, which is called a swastika. Well, right. that that is on the floor of synagogues, interestingly That's right. The enough. swastika was not German. It was Jewish. Mm -hmm. The Jews used the swastika, and the Germans picked it up from the, from the Jews. And the Jews got it because they were following the ancient religions of Phoenicia Cana, which goes back to India. And this is why in India, the Hindus and Buddhists both use the swastika and the, and the uh, Star of David. Right. The Star of David is, has nothing to do with their, uh, King David because there was no King David. So the Star of David actually is referred to, if you look it up in the dictionary, as a hexagram. H E X. Hex Hex is Latin for six. <clears throat> and interesting in Latin, six is S E X is six in Latin. Right. It and, sure and is. so today we have something called a hex H E X, which is a six pointed star. It's called the star of Saturn. That's what these H the, the, the Star of David represents as the planet Saturn. <clears throat> right. and, so there are other questions here yeah. as well, and and you've gone into this. Uh, and, and geometric shapes are a subject we could easily do a full two hour uh, discussion about just the geometry, if you will, <laughs> of yeah. the symbols, right? And the fact right. that uh, no, nothing is accidental. There are numbers to sides and points of things uh, that are completely intentional. Um, we've even talked about the uh, the five pointed star on here with you a little bit, and the six pointed star as well. I find it fascinating that uh, in England, here, here's another interesting difference between England and uh, America, which uh, which which I just note, and I'm not sure what to make of. But you know, their law enforcement badges over here, we have five pointed law enforcement uh, stars, right? Yeah, you know, for course. sheriffs and things mm -hmm. like that. But in England, not so all the time. Uh, they seem to use six-pointed uh, stars. <laughs> and, yeah, because the yeah. six-pointed star is the star of Saturn. Mm -hmm. uh, and Saturn is the Lord of the Rings. And that's why Jews are still making movies in Hollywood, Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. Lord of the Rings was the planet Saturn. Saturn was the Lord of the Rings. <clears throat> and today, the Jewish religion... <clears throat> Today, the Jewish religion is worshiping the planet Saturn. Mm -hmm. It wasn't always that way. And I've said this before, and I'll say it again. We are told that Judaism was the first monotheistic uh, religion in the world. The Jews were the first monotheistic people. The monotheistic, theistic, is, the is God. Theistic is something to do with God. Mm -hmm. Mono is one. So therefore, one God or anything dealing with the, uh, the, the, the subject of one God would call monotheistic. <clears throat> well, the Jews were not the first monotheistic people in the world. They never have been monotheistic. <clears throat> right. So if you go back into history, you will find the Jews were never monotheistic. They never worship one God. We are given the idea that uh, that there is only one God in all the universe. There's only one God, and that's the Jewish God. He is the one God, and the, and his one people are the monotheistic people who worship the one God. Until you do some research on the field and go to the encyclopedias and the reference works on the Bible, and then you will see, no, the Jews were a henotheistic, spell H-E-N-O. He no theistic, meaning he no means to pick one from a group. 
Mm-hmm. So if you have, say, 15 gods standing in front of you, and you decide you like to follow this one god, you pick him out, the one you like, like we do in, in America with with uh, our, our uh, elections. We pick out the one fool we like, <clears throat> and we elect him. And so now we've got a, 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 a deep association with the one that we pick. And so that's why I said in the book, in the, uh, in the, uh, in the Bible, Old Testament, when it talks about the Ten Commandments, the first commandment says, I am the Lord your God, and I shall not have, uh, faith, uh, other gods before me. It doesn't say, I am the only God in the universe. No, that's mm-hmm. the idea that we've been given. We uh, Gentiles have been given that idea that the Jews worshipped the only true God in the whole universe. No, they were henotheistic, not monotheistic, meaning the Jews picked one God from a group. And this is, uh, this is, this is well known in Israel today, that the picking of the one God from a group called henotheistic. <clears throat> And this is why today we have a complete misunderstanding about the God of Israel and the Bible. Because the word God in, in, in the Phoenician language was E-L. L was a name for the God Saturn. Saturn was called L. And another name for Saturn in the ancient world was... Uh, <clears throat> Shabbat. Shabbat was spelled S-H-A-B-B-A-T-H. Look it up in the dictionary. S-H-A-B-B-A-T-H. Shabbat was a name for the planet Saturn in the Middle East. A long time ago, thousands of years ago, the planet Saturn was well understood and knew that it was a planet of the rings <clears throat> and a lot of people don't realize that, that the ancient peoples of the world knew Saturn had rings, and they gave him the name of Shabbat. And so today, if you're, go- if you're going to worship the planet Saturn, you do it on Saturn's day. You do it at the Temp L, or the Temp Isle. And so today we call it, sh- the worship of Shabbat is called the Sabbath. Right. So in the Ten Commandments, remember to keep holy the Sabbath. As if you're keeping holy the Sabbath, you're keeping holy the the day is Saturday. Because Saturday is named after the Jewish god Saturn. And Saturn was called Shabbat. And so we have a celebration in Judaism called the Sabbath. Sabbath is the worship of the planet Saturn. So just remember, when you are keeping holy the Sabbath, you're not being very holy. You're still worshiping an old pagan, ancient Saturnian god, Saturn. Mm. This is why I I am so convinced that I want to tell the world the way it really is, the real truth about the religions that we have today. We don't realize that we are worshiping the same ancient god's that the ancient pagans had, and we like to criticize them because they were ignorant and ill-informed and ancient peoples, they didn't know anything about nothing, and so we are highly intelligent today. No, in point of fact, it's just the opposite. The ancient peoples knew far more than we will ever be able to understand. The, the builders of the pyramids and the great temples of the world have all understood the universe and the whole concept of the divine presence in the universe we call God. They knew far more about God than you will ever know. They knew far more about sacred geometry, <clears throat> the building of temples, than we will ever know. And so nothing is more obvious than the fact that the ancient peoples knew things we don't know. They are, the Hindus have learned and taught us more about space and time and all the high sciences that we don't even begin to understand today. And so we are not the ultimate 
creation of God on the earth today. We well, are an ignorant and ill-informed backwards people mm. we call human beings. Right. We humans are backwards. We are not very well read. We're not very well educated. And we think we know everything there is to know about the whole universe, where in point of fact, you don't even understand your own religion. Well, I've got two more questions from people that are inquiring that have been listening, and uh, or, or at least I, I know one of them has, but uh, these these will fit perfectly, I think. And we'll go a little bit long here because we, we took a little bit of time before we got Jordan on. We'll go a little longer in this hour and a little longer in the next hour, and I'll cut it back down to two when we put it together. Uh, as long as uh, Jordan can hang around, we'll do it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay. Sure. So uh, here's the thing. Let, let's see. Uh, can you please ask Jordan uh, why it seems like every religion has some sort of singing or chanting in it? Christians sing. Uh, Jews do songs. Although I, well, the person, although I don't like the songs, they do songs. Um, there is a, a, a something that sounds like singing that Muslims do, as well as uh, excuse me, yep. Hindus and a few others. Why is singing a common thread in all of the religions that exist today? And was that always the case? Yes, because vibration, audio, audio vibrations are very important to spiritually understanding the universe. Mm-hmm. We have scientists who are telling you about the difference between uh, who built the pyramids and how they were built, and some are saying that vibrations, sounds, sounds are very important, and vibrations and sounds are extremely important to the human brain, how the brain re, uh, relates to spiritual sounds. And we know that the great uh, uh, composers during the Middle Ages, the, the master composers were composing music according to mathemat- mathematics, and that the, it wasn't just a beautiful sound they were producing. No, it was a mathematical understanding of vibrations that the brain relates to, that the human mind can relate to certain vibrational frequencies. And it puts you into a spiritual state of mind. This is why when you go to churches, sometimes during some of the big churches in Europe, you go in and you just feel the the feeling in the church is just so very strange. It's like a spiritual presence there. No, it's not a spiritual presence. The, what you're feeling in those churches is called geomancy. Geomancy is the study of ley lines. Ley lines are electrical forces, force frequencies on the earth that the ancient peoples knew all about. The Celtic Druids from Europe were experts on where the ley lines are on the earth. They said that there are that there are lines of electrical power going on on the earth today. And if you stand in the front of that line, if you step on that line, you will feel that electrical frequency go through you. And you can feel that there's something godly going on. There's something otherworldly you're feeling. No, it's just a, uh, it's just a different kind of electrical frequency. It's called ley lines. And if you go back and you look at it, that's what you're doing when you're singing. In churches, you are humming and, and, and communicating with the spirit world with vibrations and, and uh, frequencies. And we know all of that has been used by religions for thousands of years. Mm. And this is, why, this is why, incidentally, the music industry today in Hollywood, is able to captivate the minds of young people and captivate in motion pictures. They have something called mood music. When there's going to be some terrible thing happen, there's some kind of a sinister sound or music that tells you something is bad going to happen. If it was a happy scene, you will have the music to accompany a happy scene. So Hollywood makes music to present a particular scene in a movie. And so it's called mood music. It puts you in the right mood to experience what the movie is going to show you. 
So music has always been used to connect the human brain to the spirit world. That's why music is so profoundly important today when you see how the young people are being misled into and the and rap music was developed by the people who developed the uh, rap music was developed by what we would call the British East India Company. And it, it has to do with the idea of privatizing uh, uh, jails. Prisons are being privatized. Prisons are being opened up and run by private corporations. And so in order for those corporations to make money, they have to have a lot of, uh, they have to have a lot of prisoners. Mm -hmm. And so the only way you're going to get a lot of prisoners is to whip the people up in the country to be prisoners and to be criminals so they can be prisoners. So you, the same people who came up with the idea of privatizing prisons have come up with the idea of the best way to, to run a prison is to have it filled with people. And so if you have it filled with people, you're making money because it's a private institution. It's a private operation. And so they they came up with the idea, the same people came up with the idea for private prisons, came up with the idea of rap music. Mm -hmm. And we know that because we've heard and I've read the articles by the people who gave us rap music. They said the same people realize if you're going to have a privatized prison, you need to have plenty of prisoners. And how you do that? Well, you you make prisoners out of putting it into the spirit of the of the people to be revolutionaries, radicals, and criminals, and you give them music that promotes that, and that promotes that kind of an, uh, understanding of the world. Rap music is designed to create uh, a criminal element so that we'll have criminals to put into prisons. If we got a big prison, a brand new prison, but you don't have any prisoners, you're just losing money. I'd like to run a couple of my thoughts by you real quickly here related to exactly this subject because I am very much attuned to the uh, study of acoustics and sound and the resulting effects of them uh, personally. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, because I was a musician and, uh, I, I still to this day appreciate the science behind it. Um, so let us understand a couple of things. First, when you were talking about churches and the experience of being in a church, another thing that comes into play here is the architecture. And why? Because, uh, the, the effects, uh, of just You're the right. breeze blowing, People yep. being inside, the echoing, if you ever notice when you step on a hard floor in a church and you hear that kind of echo that's sort of unique to a church, it is because the architectural design is literally right. constructed to have that effect. And that is a cumulative effect creating that same atmosphere. It's not just the ley lines, mind you, but it is the utilization of the ley lines that give you the energy, the effect, and the ability to really suspend and excite uh, various parts of the human brain. And believe it or not, the construction of the place, the materials in it, as well as the selection of the tones used, whether it is in the music or it is in the bells in the church towers, are yep. all relative to this, right? That's so exactly right. That's, that's one what I'm thing. talking about. Mm-hmm. And uh, but you you didn't mention the architecture. That's why I was throwing it in. But I, I know you know this. It's just yep. I figured I'll, th- I'll throw some of my thoughts in uh, here as we go. The other thing is when you're talking about constructing uh, a, a music and the fact that uh, some people created blueprints to manipulate the population. It was not only done uh, to to uh, to fuel the prison industrial complex, but various other effects that seem to have been organic things in society were also seemingly directed in exactly the same way. And this has to do, again, with the effects of tone. See, a lot of people think about music and they say, oh, yeah, the lyrics in a particular song created and gave ideas to people. And that can be true on some level. You don't necessarily get manipulated by just, you know, hearing somebody's words. You you can have an effect given to you if you're listening carefully or your mind is in the right state to receive them. Now, how do you get the mind in the right state to receive those lyrics? Well, with certain tonal cues, 
uh, the mind can become more receptive to the idea, can become uh, uh, cr- create almost like faux emotional reactions as well. And this is not necessarily something that's always done for a negative purpose. I mean, obviously, there are artists who are still creating who are not being manipulated by others, although they may be... Um, using the templates that are presented to them by others in some mm-hmm. cases and inadvertently creating things that they don't necessarily realize what they're doing. There's organic artistry, but then again, there's also very well-directed, purposeful use of these things as well. And uh, uh, some people, again, if they're independent, they might be using it to create a mood, to get a sentiment out, to tell a story, whatever it may be. But uh, but when you uh, have have a group of individuals who are, are also familiar with this science and uh, wish to create trends, wish to create directions in a society or in a subculture, this is also a way to do it. And it's all of these things. It's not just the lyrics. It's not just the tones. It's not just the undertones, the many things that a lot of people don't even hear when they're listening to music directly or consciously. But a lot of subconscious messages can be sent by a continuous tone underneath the music that, again, is is not even really truly audible uh, during the time you're listening to it or you're hearing it in the background, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, all, all of these things, I mean, do you disagree with anything I'm offering as no, my thoughts? No, 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 that's exactly right. And I would add to that that there was a book put out many years ago uh, that was a phenomenally important book called Four Arguments for the Elimination of Television Mm. by Jerry Mander, M-A-N-D-E-R. Four Arguments for the Elimination of Television. And in this book, the the man who wrote it was the head of an advertising agency in San Francisco that, that advertised the biggest corporations in the world. He was in charge of uh, promoting Ford Motor Company, General Electric, General Motors, etc. And his company was very, very large. And he said in his book that he quit. He walked off and and walked away from the industry because he wanted to tell the people what was really going on with television. And he explained how television actually works and who founded it who did the experimenting on television and and brought it into our world and how it works and what it does and uh, electrically what it does with us. And he was saying that the Germans, the Nazis, were very big on working up, trying to come together, bring their their knowledge together to create what they called television. Mm -hmm. The Nazis were. It was a Nazi operation to try and figure out how to... Uh, give pictures to the human population on the earth, how you could uh, propagandize them with movies and television and pictures and sounds. And so it has a Nazi connection, uh, you know, television does. But the other point he, he brought out, I think it was very germane to what we're talking about, is that television is firing the uh, the the... The picture tube is firing uh, uh, a rays, uh, electronic signals, and the, and there's the electronic signals that fire the pictures onto the screen. It also has another electronic signal connected to it. It's called. It's called. It's uh, uh, the term he used. I seem to recall it was like a writing. This other signal was writing on the main signal to send you the pictures. The carrier wave. There's another, yeah, and so that other signal that you don't see is designed, it was based on something called earth resonant frequency. Mm-hmm. Earth resonant frequency was a frequency of, of uh, vibrations and sound that uh, puts you to sleep. That's why he says it's the same frequency if you sit under a big tree and 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 a meadow where the, everything is very quiet, very peaceful. You're sitting on the ground and you're laying up against the tree and you fall asleep. It's called earth frequency. There's a frequency that the earth is giving off that you are feeling as a human and it puts you to sleep. 
And so he said, so the same frequency, and he gave the, he gave the number of it and explained it. And he said that that's what's, when you sit down to watch TV, it is designed, television is designed to, to hit your brain with an earth resonant frequency as it is giving you audio and video pictures. And what it's doing is putting your brain to sleep so that you will not give it, you will not have any problem accepting whatever it is you're seeing is putting your brain to sleep with something called earth resonant frequency. And, and the mind goes to sleep even though you're sitting there with your eyes open, your brain is sleeping. And you don't even realize it. Now they're telling you stuff on the television, you know, the television show, which is propaganda, is putting you to sleep and telling you what you to, what you should think and how to think and how the how to view things. So it's a it's a propaganda machine. But he said, uh, the point I really liked is he said something to the effect that. Television is propaganda, but propaganda does not deceive you. Propaganda helps you to deceive yourself. You're buying into it when you sit there in front of a television and watch it, so-called news programs. Or the, net, the network news uh, is actually a propaganda machine to put you to sleep so you will believe whatever it tells you. Right. Well, you know, Jordan, before we go to it, I want to take a short break, a very, very short break. But before we do that, you know, it's not just the news that you're you're placed into this uh, susceptible kind of uh, brainwave state. Um, I have another guest who talks about how that that state that they use, you know, the uh, the frequency that that they use for everything from your electricity to your television, to your electronics, to everything is actually a little bit off from where it could be they could make it a lot more natural and yep. not agitate everybody but they don't and it has something to do with changes that were made post world war ii based on the german design which uh, make things just a little less healthy a little less uh comfortable and everything else and this is why you see that uh we we have had a greater time of agitation post world war ii uh, and he's, you know, a, a master electrician, right, explaining right. this. And he talks about it all the time. And it's really, it, it gets me a little confused, but it is precisely what you're discussing here. And and one might say, well, look, of course we know news is propaganda. Well, here's another quick thought. Um, I've watched television. Of course, you have, Jordan. Uh, almost anybody who's listening to this, I guarantee you, has at one time watched television. Of course. Um, you ever notice that... Uh, yeah, you might get hungry for the cheeseburger they show you on TV. Of course, and I know why. <laughs> well, th th this is the same thing. Be it's not really that you were hungry. It's not really. No, no. But, you know, and, and see, here's the thing. It's not just propaganda in the words and the pictures, but it's also the design of what's happening to your brainwaves. So literally, you have now convinced yourself that you want that cheeseburger Yep. <laughs> you know, or or sub or pizza or whatever it is. I, I I find this every time. Even looking at these commercials on uh on other things like you know YouTube and stuff because I get stuck with commercials all the time. Um, you know, it, it, you look at it and you go, you know, I I actually would like to eat <laughs> whatever course, they have in front know, of you. <laughs> I remember an interview <clears throat> done with a man who owned a drive-in theater in Los Angeles. And he was being interviewed about the concept of drive-in theaters and where it started and mm -hmm. how it began and, and how how uh, important is it, how lucrative is it, the whole business of drive-in theaters. And he said, well, we actually put into the films, we have uh, one frame every so often uh, showing you a picture of a hamburger and fries and and cold drinks and seven up or whatever and it's a frame that's actually in the end of the movie and we and, and it's just one frame but it's quite a few of them but there's there's space every every 10 or 15 frames there will be a picture of the hamburger and french fries and it says we're hungry and he says so we put that into the film so people watching the film do not realize they just have one frame that they didn't even see. It was just so quick, but the brain picked it up. The mind picked it up. Mm -hmm. 
and you didn't realize that your brain saw it and it is now talking to you. You're getting hungry. You need to go and get something to eat. And he said that's because it's in the, we actually put that picture in the film. And it was only one or two times we did it, but, uh, but it's enough for the people when the movie is over wanting to come in and buy food. That's what we want. That's what we want them to do is come in and buy. That's how we're making our money. Right. And we, we, prov- we provide them with the idea in the movie. They didn't even see it. So, like I said, uh, you know, propaganda doesn't deceive you. It helps you to deceive yourself. Oh, right. And, and look, this cuts all different ways, but, but like I said, it could be about selling you an idea. It could be about selling you a cheeseburger, but one way or another, uh, very much it's about convincing you that, uh, something is good and you're ready for it. And doesn't that frighten you just a little bit when they're doing war reporting? After all, uh, I, I find that people that watch more news about a war or about a terrible situation seem to accept it more. They really do. And, uh, of course, th- this sounds almost like we're not talking about religion. But once again, when you create an environment, like whether it's a drive-in movie theater, which those things have gone away because sophistication is well beyond splicing in a frame of a picture of food anymore. Uh, you know, th- there's a lot of different ways this is done. Some of them, some of it is done with harmonics. There is a reason why there is a music bed. There is a reason why there is a sound bed to these things. Uh, That's right. which is not, again, necessarily audible, just like that frame is not something that you're going to recall. Well, I saw a picture of a cheeseburger and fries. Nope. You, you might not recall that, but your, your mind, your subconscious mind picks right. that stuff up very well. saw it, right. <clears throat> so, and I know that's true because I've had it happen to me. <laughs> right. 